Thanks so much, Josh. Um, welcome one more time to the Elm City Vineyard. As Josh said, my name's Matt. And um, this is, uh, I was out of town this weekend, um, but before I left, I was um, driving in the car on Friday, keeping some tabs on some things that have been happening recently, checking in on the, um, on the inauguration and thinking about um, our series on Amos. Um, one of Amos's things that he thinks about is kind of the role of religion in public life. And I was struck in um, thinking about the inauguration and uh, listening and um, just how many times uh, I mean, God was, uh, was invoked many, many times in the inauguration. There's a prayer of invocation. There was not one but two Bibles um, used uh, for the oath. Um, there were uh, multiple references uh, to the creator uh, in, the, in the speech. Uh, one was an applause line. There, was, uh, there were three faith leaders um, who... Uh, kind of give blessings and prayers at the end of uh, the ceremony, and I've probably missing uh, some others. And you know, there's something, I want to say, there's something quite right about this. Uh, making space to acknowledge God's goodness and presence at all times and everywhere. Acknowledging our gratitude to God as the ultimate source of every good thing. Seeking God's guidance when it comes to very, very difficult, the difficult problems that face our world. But there's also something deeply, deeply disturbing about it, um, particularly at a time when the gap between rich and poor is growing at a rate it never has before, when fundamental biblical values like the welcome of the immigrant and the stranger, provision for the poor, the sanctity of human life, and the fundamental equality of all before the God in whose image we have been created, when these fundamental values seem to be forgotten or even worse, publicly renounced. There's something wrong about the invocation of the divine name in the carrying on of business as usual. As Abraham Lincoln said in his second inaugural address, it is strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. 150 years later, we seem no less brazen in our asking God's continued assistance to do the same. And I don't think you have to be particularly partisan about it. Um, There are central threads of our nation's stories that are just fundamentally opposed to who we professed God to be and what we know about God, who we know God to be. The American original sin of slavery, the systematic genocide of native peoples, Um, without either of which the America we celebrate, be it a blue or red America, simply would not be possible. Two sins, at least, upon which our present way of life continues to depend. The new Jim Crow of mass incarceration, whose mechanisms share a direct lineage with the slavery of old. The continued exploitation of native lands for the needs of global industrialization. Given this history and our present practices that continue this wickedness, there is something ironic when we invoke God's name in our political process. And if we're honest with ourselves about our own lives, I think we'd have to say there's something ironic about any time we invoke, we invoke God's name, period. We, who can only speak God's name as those who so often live in enmity towards God's, in opposition toward God's purposes. When we seek God's blessing for our arrogant aims, when we ask God to enable our flourishing at the expense of another, when we justify our selfish interests in theological language, even if we only do that justification internally. At moments like these, where is the presence of God to be found? That's what we're going to talk about this afternoon Where should we look for the presence of God when we're on the wrong path in a pretty clear way? Because I think that's a 
place we're often in, individually and certainly collectively. Because the good news is that a gracious God is present to us, present with us, even in our rebellion against God. And God calls us back again and again, and we just need to be ready to hear the peculiar sound of God's voice at times such as these, so that we can respond to God's gracious invitation and return to God. And so as we ask this question, we're continuing in our series on the book of Amos, a book of prophecy in the Hebrew Bible from the 8th century B.C. As Josh described last week in his introduction to the series, Amos was writing to the people of God, but to a people who had wandered away from the path that God had for God's people in a, in a, in a number of different ways. And as we saw last week, we will again see that God's words to the people in Amos um, resonate today, um, that speak to our environment, to our unjust world, to the ways that we have wandered from God's uh, will for God's people, relevance to our fickle hearts that mingle piety with enmity toward the good things of God. And we will hear anew God's word to us, that is to his people. Seek God and live. Live justly, live rightly, live as my people. As we, as we enter in, let's, let's, uh, let's pray together, if you will. Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would be present here in this space, that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive from you what it is that you have to speak to us. We pray that you would help us to both understand your unconditional love for us and your um, sometimes opposition to our projects. Let your word um, speak to us with clarity and without uh, condemnation. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Amen. So we're here in Amos chapter four. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 gonna get real. All right. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, <clears throat> who are on Mount Samaria, you who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to their husbands. <laughs> Yeah, um, who say to their husbands, bring something to drink. This is a theme we've seen already in Amos. God's concern over the people's unjust treatment of the vulnerable. You who oppress the poor, you who crush the needy. Not just in, injustice though in this case, but decadence. These, um, these cows that are invoked were notoriously fat and happy. Um, here, Amos seems to be picking up on a particular kind of, um, he has in mind, I think, a particular cross-section of wealthy women up in the north. Um, but don't worry, um, it, he brings back the same sort of critique for everyone um, uh, equally, at least um, everyone, both genders in the upper class of the society. Um, and it fits with other parts uh, where he generalizes this accusation and applies it to the elite of God's people more generally. You can look in Amos chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. We'll get there uh, in a week or two. But this is a critique of, of, of luxury, of sloth made possible and built on the backs of the poor and the needy who are crushed and oppressed in order to make possible this sort of life. This is a critique of the sort of decadence that turns every relationship into an instrument of self-gratification. Each person is just someone I can use to fulfill my every whim and desire. So this is a decadence that depends upon and therefore reinforces the oppression of the poor. This is a decadence that corrupts even the more intimate relationships, which become mere tools for getting us what we want. Fetch me a drink. It's hard not to see at least some piece of the dream of American consumption in this picture. I know, um, I mean, we can start at this sort of 
almost silly, but I know what it is to sit on the couch on a Friday night and playfully try to convince my wife that she should be the one to get up and pop some popcorn because I'm too lazy to invest two minutes and 25 seconds in the gratification of my appetite. <laughs> and I can joke about that, but there's something more insidious connected there as well, more intricate ways that our culture tries to convince us to use one another as means to our consumer ends. And so much of this consumer dream depends upon and reinforces oppression of the poor. Now granted, in many cases, these days, we have industrialized our oppression of the poor such that it happens outside our view. The sweatshop labor happens overseas. This is the unmentionable reason that manufacturing jobs have been shipped overseas. We want our goods produced more cheaply than we would be willing to stomach if the human cost were ever present before our eyes. We want this. We don't want to see it in front of us. We would have to admit, I think, that Amos's critique lands squarely on our shoulders. So where is the presence of God to be found in the midst of this sort of disorder? Amos goes on. This is in the voice of God, inviting the people, come to Bethel and transgress, to Gilgal, and multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Bring a thank offering of leavened bread and proclaim free will offerings. Publish them. For so you love to do, O people of Israel, says the Lord God. Yes, that is the Lord God who made the heavens and the earth being sarcastic. Apparently, Whenever the presence, wherever the presence of God is, the worship at Bethel and Gilgal is, isn't it. And Bethel and Gilgal, especially Bethel in particular, this is a well-known place of worship um, in Israel. And God taunts the people, inviting them to continue to go through the motions of religious observance while neglecting the poor. This is what they do. This is what they love to do, God says. And not just this, but they also brag about their religious observance. They publish their piety. They check in at church on Facebook. They tweet their righteous causes. They got the t-shirt and wear it proudly. None of which would be so bad, perhaps, were it not for the hypocrisy of it all. Now one might wonder, and Bible scholars have, is this idolatry that is... Is this the worship of gods other than the gods of Israel or the God of Israel? Um, historically, uh, probably not. Um, but ultimately, maybe it doesn't matter because either way, the God who is worshipped under these circumstances, a, a, a God who is worshipped as one who endorses and helps make possible the oppression of the poor and the crushing of the needy, this sort of worship is not of the God of Israel regardless of who is named in the sanctuary. So long as the poor are trampled, the presence of this God is not to be found in the temple. So our question persists. Where is the presence of God to be found? And Amos gives three answers, but they all boil down to variations on a single theme. They're, they all answer in various ways that there is a presence in absence. There's a presence in various sorts of absences. So first we see God withdraw God's presence as provider. I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places, yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. That's not this sort of cleanness of teeth. Um, this is a euphemism for famine. And also, I also withheld the rain, yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. I laid waste your gardens and your vineyards, yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. God says, I have withdrawn my provision of food, of rain, of agriculture. And all of this absence is supposed to reveal God's presence to the people. God is flummoxed that despite all this revelation of God and God's judgment, the people have not returned. 
you see this withdrawal of, of God is ultimately for the sake of the good of the people, to point them away from the destructive path that they're on, to sound the alarm in times of unjust abundance. But as so often happens, this alarm goes unheeded, perhaps even unnoticed, especially among the wealthy who have guaranteed their abundance in all circumstances through their oppression of the poor, creating the illusion, for a moment at least, that their wealth comes from some source other than God's presence as provider. And while they, by which I mean we, name themselves and their own hard work and diligence as, the, as guarantors of their luxury. The reality is that in the short term, it is systematic oppression of the poor that insulates the wealth of the rich from the ups and downs of the market, while in the long term, they are no less dependent on the goodness of God, the source of every good gift, than anybody else is. But for a season at least, this warning of God goes unheeded. The passage goes on. I sent among you a pestilence in after the manner of Egypt, yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. I overthrew some of you, yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. God responds to God's people as God responds to God's enemies. Egypt, the kind of the, the storied enemies of the people of God are invoked and the people are behaving as Egypt did. They're oppressing the poor, crushing the needy, and this um, is what God accused the Egyptians of doing in Exodus when God intervened on the people's behalf to free them from the hands of oppressive Egyptian rule. And so here the accusation points not at the enemies of the people, but at the people of God themselves. This is always and everywhere the case. God has but one people, we who routinely show ourselves to be God's enemies, whom God nevertheless pursues in love. And so God responds to the people um, as God responds to God's enemies, <laughs> opposing their projects. Yet this is supposed to function as revelation of the divine presence. Therefore, this I, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God. For lo, the one who forms the mountains, this is a, a kind of doxology of who God is, the one who forms the mountains, creates the wind, reveals his thoughts to mortals, makes the morning darkness, and treads on the heights of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Israel encounters God, meets God in God's absence. The absence of God's provision, even the inversion of God's provision in God's opposition to the people's enmity. All this is intended as revelation, as a way to encounter the living God, to warn the people to change their ways, to return to God. And so we see that if we're looking for God's presence in the midst of our enmity to God in the form of our oppression of the poor, then there is at least one obvious place to look. We should look for divine opposition to our plans. And that goes for us as individuals, sure. If you've got a plan you're running and it involves um, or depends for its success on the oppression of the poor, you might look for God's presence and God's opposition to your plan. But the same should be said of us collectively. If we found our way of life on the oppression of God's special portion, the poor, then we can expect to see God working in opposition to our way of life. If the American dream is, as it seems it might be, fundamentally built on the oppression of the poor and the disenfranchisement of the marginalized, then we might look for God's presence in the weakening of our economy and the unraveling of our democracy. If, evangelical, if, if, if American evangelicalism is, as it seems it might be, fundamentally invested in an overtly racist, classist, and sexist America of the past, then we might look for God's presence in the steady secularization of our nation. God loves us. God loves us. But God is not necessarily invested in our projects. Let me say that again. God loves us. 
And because God loves us so much, God is not necessarily invested in all of our projects. The unconditional love of God for God's people has to involve God's uh, opposition of the people's projects when the people's projects are in opposition to God's good purposes for them and for the rest of the world. God's presence revealed at times and God's absence will, in these cases, be revealed in God's opposition to our projects. All of this comes to us as a warning, as God's pleading with us to stop building our collective house upon such unjust and ultimately such weak foundations. But there is yet one more form that God's presence in absence can take. And we actually see it later in Amos, in Amos chapter 8, in a passage that connects to our own through some shared imagery of light turned to darkness. On that day, says the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. God's been promising some of this opposition. He says, all right, let me tell you about the day that this is going to happen. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on all loins and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. The time is surely coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, or a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. God promises a day of judgment, a final revelation of God in God's absence, when there will be a famine of a different sort, a famine of God's word. The final revelation of God's presence in absence is the deafening sound of God's silence. And we have to admit, in times like these, as the people we are, God's people and God's enemies wrapped into one, From time to time, God's revelation comes to us in God's silence. If we confine God's speech too narrowly, if we ask God to speak only to give advice on how best to execute an unjust plan, if we invite God to speak several steps downstream from a crucial moral error, then we may find that the answer to our prayers is silence. God's unwillingness to partner with us to sanction our projects as we've defined them. In such moments, if we're able to hear it, this silence is itself a word from God, a revelation of God to us and for us. There is an opportunity in this silence to return to God if and only if we hear this silence, if and only if everything grinds to a halt when God refuses to speak. This famine of God's word can, in fact, be a sign and an unveiling of God's presence. There is an opportunity in the silence of God. The danger, however, is that the silence of God can become just one more missed sign in the unyielding march of a stubborn people away from the ways of God and toward their own destruction. The danger is that the routine of our piety, of our religiosity, our spirituality, church on Sunday, home group on Tuesday, sundry church meetings and daily prayers, these patterns actually end up covering up God's silence. The danger is that all our spiritual carrying on drowns out the deafening sound of God's silence. And we keep on doing church when the reason we exist as church 
has gone silent. One of my favorite theologians, Karl Barth, describes it this way. Everything is in order, but everything is also in the greatest disorder. The mill is turning, but it is empty as it turns. All the sails are hoisted, but no wind fills them to drive the ship. The fountain adorned with many spouts is there, but no water comes. It is a terrible thing when God keeps silence and by keeping silence speaks. This is the empty religiosity that goes on uninterrupted by the occasional inconvenience of God's silence. What we need, first of all then, is a religiosity, a spiritual way of life that is ready at any moment to be upended, not just by God's speech, but also by God's silence. We need the sort of spiritual life as individuals and as a church that comes grinding to a halt the moment God falls silent. And for what it's worth, I think that we've actually done some good work here at ECV to cultivate that sort of life together. Each week and in our home groups, we're learning to listen and discern the voice of God such that God's word, and I hope also God's silence, can shape our common life. Hopefully, and and this is a hope which assigns to us a responsibility. Hopefully, our way of life together is configured in such a way that when God falls silent, things around here start to sputter. So that we can hear the sound of God's silence and respond and return to God. So let me tell you, there's good news for you if you have been struggling with God's silence. And I know that in a community like this one, or in a community the size of this one, that there are always folks for whom this is the case. If you've been brought to the point of crisis by the cessation of God's speech, rejoice, first of all that God's silence has brought about a crisis. That's actually a really good sign. The time to be worried is when God is silent and everything just churns along anyway. In fact, my sense is that God's silence isn't always a sign of God's judgment, right? I think the, the possibility of God falling silent happens at other times in our lives. Sometimes God's silence is an opportunity to reveal to us the extent that our lives really are, or are not, founded on God's word on listening to, discerning, and obeying what God is saying to us. But if this is where you're at, like I said, first of all, rejoice. And second, take some time to consider what is God speaking in God's silence? What has been revealed about your life and its dependence on God's word? Some of that may be really, really good, actually. Maybe something to, 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 to rejoice in in that moment, as hard as it is. Sometimes God's silence comes in opposition to our, our injustice. Sometimes God speaks through silence in other ways. And in every case, God keeps silence in order to expose the true motivation of our religion. It's hard to think about this um, too much in one's, own, in one's own life. You start thinking about the judgment of God, and you start thinking, well, I mean, shoot, if I'm going to kind of declare that I've recognized God's judgment in my life, I'm kind of usurping God's ability to, to freely judge and <laughs> evaluate what's going on in my life. But as far as I can tell, a few, a few years back, um, well, I can tell you at least about a moment when um, all of a sudden the water wasn't in the wheel and the, there were no wind no wind in the sails and things came apart. I was at the end of my um, uh, master's degree. We were about to plant this church, we thought, and um, I applied to graduate school and uh, it was a long shot, but it was the only shot that was going to keep the various things that God was doing in my life all together. And I uh, was just kind of sailing along and it all seemed like it was going to work out really well, especially for me and certain sorts of dreams that I had. And Dreams that I got back at the end of the day. I, but we were going along, and all of a sudden, the, this, this, it was just, you know, one of, the, one of these things that happens in your life. You just get a, a quick email, I think. Well, it was a horrible way to find out, actually. I found out from a current graduate student in the program that I had applied to. Um, I said, oh, yeah, yeah. She said, what do you think about doing next year? Oh, I'm, I'm applied to this PhD program here, actually. She said, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
what do you mean? What do you mean you're sorry? It's like, oh, that... They'd emailed the current graduate students who it was that they had admitted so they could get in touch with them before they had uh, uh, actually told those, those of us who didn't get in that we hadn't. That was an amazing conversation uh, with that student. Um, and um, that was, boy, the wind came out at that point. And um, there were some ways that kind of uh, been thinking about life that just sort of looked like um, me kind of building what I wanted in the directions that I wanted to go and God just sort of making it happen. And um, it was a real season of just all of a sudden, like I said, just kind of it, the, the kind of the wind came out of the sails and we spent some time. And at the end of the day, there were months um, of seeking and new relationships and old ones renewed, and it was a refining time to figure out who God was and how he was at work in my life and why I wanted the things that I wanted and what parts of this project God might be invested in and what parts of it he, he wasn't. And um, I think in the end of the day, God pulls the rug out from under us for good reasons, and there was a receiving back of receiving back, in this case, of this particular project of graduate school in a way that, um, well, if it felt like I had earned it, <laughs> uh, it wouldn't have been received with the same sort of gratitude. There was a revelation of the kind of dependence that I had in my life on the presence of God and provision of all good gifts rather than the kind of ability for me to secure and so that fall, when I spent some time, uh, I was invited by a friend to come have this guy I'd never met who heard from God pray for me. And he kind of spoke God's word to me about, uh, he gave me the courage to go and, and reapply and, and kind of start this whole process over again. There was, it was marked um, as God's project in a different sort of way, right? Um, if it had been my project before. God's silence, God's absence can reveal God's presence. And it's for, it's because he loves us. It's because he loves us that he will withdraw from us when we need to kind of have the air taken out for a bit or when we just need to become aware again of our dependence, of the ways that are the things that we really want are gifts that come from our Heavenly Father. Some questions and some thoughts for, for reflection and for action. First, how is your abundance dependent on God's provision? How is your abundance dependent on God's provision? Everything in our culture, right? The American dream is if you work hard, you'll deserve it and you'll get what you want. It's a lie. In what ways is, is your abundance, either the one that you ha you're experiencing now or the one that you're seeking in the future, how is that actually dependent on God's pr provision? And if you're in that season of abundance or whatever part of your life you are in a season of, of, of abundance, how can you cultivate gratitude? And if you're still looking for that season of abundance, how can you cultivate, cultivate gratitude in the meantime? And how can you cement that God is the one uh, from whom all good gifts come? Second, I challenge you to ask God to distinguish God's, opposition, uh, God's unconditional love for you from God's support of or opposition to various projects in which you are invested. That's nice and simple language there. So the, the, the point is to say, um, I think we need to kind of, I think this is, this is deep heart work to figure out kind of, all right, God, would you show me how you are unconditionally invested in me, that you love me? But can you help kind of cut that apart from your sometimes support and sometimes opposition to various projects, various plans, various uh, things that I'm working on, things that I hope for, dreams that I have, right? Can you separate, God, can you help separate that out so that I can receive from you, Lord, so I can receive this sort of clarity and direction and sometimes hear that hard word that just says no, at least not that way. <laughs> 
right? Without feeling condemnation and a lack of love. But actually experiencing that is part of and an outgrowth and a manifestation of your real genuine love for me that loves me too much to let me kind of wander in and for you to just sort of cheer for me and, so, and cheer on and support whatever it is I take on. Because sometimes I take on some things that a loving God has to, out of God's love for me, oppose. Third, has God been silent? Has God been silent for you? If so, what is God trying to say through that silence? said, my hunches that are a number who are in this room, and you need to hear it, I'll keep saying it again, uh, because you've gone off in the, in, a, in the wrong direction is not the only reason God falls silent, <laughs> okay? So some people are in this room, and you're like, the silence, yes. Um, hmm, why? I don't know yet. I'll tell you at least one reason why, right? It's in order to reveal to you the extent to which your life is in fact built on this relationship with God. And the fact that you know, you've noticed the silence. This is good. If this has brought you to crisis, that is good. It's good news. There's something, therefore, for you from God in the silence. Regardless, whatever the situation, whatever the cause. What is God trying to say through the silence? And finally, I... This is the thing that God apparently kept wanting. Return to God. I don't know what that means for you. That's going to depend on uh, where you're headed now, what the turn looks like. That depends on um, kind of where you are with God. Maybe you have, maybe return doesn't sound right to you. Maybe you think, I I don't know, I've never been uh, with God. I'm still trying to figure out who God is and who God is for me. Um, but the, what the, the way the Bible talks about this says, well, God, we, we have an origin with God whether or not we've known God. Because God is our creator. God is our father. Um, so there's a return regardless. And, and so whatever it looks like in your life, I think there's an invitation today to return to God. This is why God says all these, all these difficult things that are happening in the, life, in the lives of, of, of the Israelites. God says, I, all this happened and, you, and still you didn't return to me. Let's seize the opportunity today, whether it's in the silence, whether it's in the cessation of God's uh, provision in one or another way in your life, or even God's seeming opposition to a plan or a dream or a project in which you are invested. Each of those presences of God and God's absence, these are invitations to us to return, to turn, and to come home to our Heavenly Father. Let me invite up the worship team. We are going to um, respond and um, so much of, of, of what uh, I think what God's doing through, uh, through Amos it has uh, so much to do with, yes, uh, there's some kind of situations, projects in which we're all invested. We share them communally, uh, nationally, societally, whatever it is. Um, but there are also particular things going on in our hearts. So I, I just want, in this, in this response time, we want to make some space for us to respond, each one of us, to what God might be saying to us. And so we're going to do that in a few different ways, uh, in communion and in worship, and then later with some, uh, some uh, time of prayer. You can have, have someone pray with you, pray for you. In, in communion, we, we, we come and we remember again each week that we are God's people. And that God has but one people, God's enemies, whom he nevertheless pursues in love. And so we remember, um, as we take the, the bread and the cup, we remember um, the, the, the body of Jesus, which was broken at, at our hands and for us, both at the same time. The life of this man that was taken by us and yet given for us, and so I, I invite, invite you to come forward so that, um, to, to tear off a piece of the bread, um, Jesus' body broken for you, and to dip it in the cup, his blood shed for you as a way of saying, God, this is who we are. We are your people. We want to return to you. So Holy Spirit, we just say, come and have your way in this place.
Would, you, would your, would your um, call of love just be clear here in this place? Would you call us, even in, when, the, when the word of love is hard, Lord, would you provide us even with the courage to receive it? Where there are long stories, long arcs that have been years of um, struggle with various senses of your absence, God. Would you whisper even in your silence to us this afternoon? Would we be able to hear you? Come and have your way.